Welcome to those of you wherever you are on God's globe. I'm grateful for your interest in truth. When Jesus prayed to his Father, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And it is truth alone that sanctifies. And so God bless you for your interest in the truth. Before we attempt to answer these questions, let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the invitation to come boldly to the throne of grace. And we come in the name of Jesus, who calls himself the truth. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is truth, 1 John 5, 6. God himself is truth, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. So we come, Lord, we want to be a member of the family of truth. I ask you to forgive us if we've sinned against you. Put your words in my mouth, I pray. Give me simple language and give to those listening a receptive heart. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's have the first question. The first question, Pastor, your calling I can tell is to preach obedience, but that's not what saves. Mm -hmm. Are you missing the vital point? He who has Christ has life. All right, I'll deal with that last. Let's get the next question because that's very important. All right. Do we have to know all the Bible to be saved? Is it okay to invest in these times? We do not know, we do not have to know all the Bible in the sense that you are familiar with every microscopic detail, but we ought to know the essentials of the gospel. That is, the problem is sin. Associated with that problem is the related problem that you cannot save yourself. That is why God sent his son, and the, the cooperative work of the Father and the Son with the Holy Spirit provided what we know to be the gospel, which is salvation. And so you and I need a savior. We need those essentials. And having been saved, how do we remain in that state? And that is walking in the truth, walking in the light, living a life in accordance and harmony with the word of God. And so you need not know every single detail, but you should learn and learn and learn and learn as much as you can as long as you're alive. Never stop learning God's word because the word is life, the word is truth, the word is power. Do we have to know and understand about the sanctuary message to be saved? The gospel is laid out for us in the sanctuary. Uh, many of us don't understand the absolute importance of understanding the essentials of the sanctuary message. The sanctuary services and all the details were given to a people who had spent generations in idolatrous land of Egypt, a polytheistic society. As a matter of fact, when God called Moses to go speak to Pharaoh, Moses said in Exodus 3 verse 13, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? So Moses knew that the Israelites had largely forgotten who God was. Notice I said largely. There are always a few who uh, preserve that memory. And so he said, God, give me a name. Because they don't know who you are. And so it's, um, we need to, we need to familiarize ourselves. Walk with God know who he is by his word and the essentials of that are given to us in the sanctuary because they were so egyptianized you see they were egyptianized israelites that's why they always wanted to go back whenever they met a trial god gave them a kindergarten representation of the gospel and what it means with all the detail something abraham did not have and did not need all those details abraham did not have or methuselah or noah or seth and so we need to study the sanctuary to understand what the antitype really is. By that I mean we must study the sacrifices they brought to understand the true sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So yes, we should study the sanctuary services as they uh, teach us about the gospel and what Christ has done for us. By the way, that is what, one of the things that separates Seventh-day Adventists from every other Christian or non-Christian organization. We place a premium on the sanctuary. Ella White writes in Great Controversy, page 409, paragraph 1, The scripture which above all other had been both the foundation 
and the central pillar of the Advent movement was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. She identifies Daniel 8.14 as the cornerstone of our theology. That is sanctuary uh, information. Thank you. How do you know if your probation has closed? You don't know. All you can know is today I've given my life to Christ. God, as I said last night, he does not send you a text or a fax to tell you that's it. All we know is the spirit is working on the heart of a person. Is he convicting you? Is, if he is, then you know God is still wrestling with you to do his will. There are some people uh, upon who, to whom the spirit has ceased to speak, but they continue a behavior to which they've grown accustomed. But you don't know ah, my probation closes on July the 20th, 2022. All you know is today I have heard the convicting voice of the Spirit. What am I doing? Today the Spirit has convicted me, return the tithe. Today the Spirit has convicted me, keep the Sabbath. Today the Spirit has convicted me, break off that illicit, illicit relationship. Is the Spirit speaking to you? If he is, your probation is not closed. But you do not, for every time you say no or you reject the voice of the Spirit, the Conviction grows fainter and fainter, but no one knows the exact day when he or she has passed the point of no return. But as I said, today you have an opportunity to hold on to your Savior and cling to him. As Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Pastor Skeet, this is regards to what was said a couple nights ago. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, my time has not yet come, but he turned the water to wine anyway, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't time? Mm -hmm. Or is mm -hmm. it because then it became time to, or did he do it for another reason? Mm -hmm. Jesus honored his mother. This was his mother making a request of him. I don't recall the, the word in the Bible, but at one point, the mother of Solomon came to see him in his throne room. Normally, you came into the throne room of a king, you bowed, you prostrated yourself. Solomon bowed to her and invited her to sit next to him on the throne. Now, that was an exception why he gave her a special honor because she was his mother. Christ, in uh, the Tsar of Aegis, page 524, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes, Christ loves... Christ bless all who sought it. The Savior bless all who sought his help. He loves all the human family. But to some... He's bound by peculiarly tender associations. His heart was bound by a strong bond of affection to the family at Bethany, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. And for one of them, his most wondrous work was wrought. He reserved his most powerful miracle for those closest to him. So God, Jesus, uh, showed a special honor for his mother when he uh, did what he did. And by the way, Jesus, God shows special favor to his people. Because he, spoke, he, he consistently showed special favor to the Israelites. He consistently did that. And so he showed special favor to a people who were close to him and also to individuals who were close to him. All right. This one just came in. Mm -hmm. I was listening to medication without prescription and I was touched by your words. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is such an important aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do you proceed with a marriage or relationship that was or is abusive, whether physically, emotionally? All right. So now, that's a very, very serious situation. The Bible gives us one clear, one clear basis for divorce, and that's uh, a violation of the vows, whether through adultery, fornication, whatever. It's very clear on that. Now, the church may give other reasons for which there isn't clear biblical reason, but the clear Bible justification is a violation of the marital vows. Now, there is such a thing as separation if you're in such a situation. Yes, but understand, separation is not divorce. So even if you separate to save your own life, you can't go form a relationship with somebody else. You can't do that. That's why marriage is such a serious thing once you enter into it. So if you're being abused and beaten up and interventions have been tried, whether the pastor, relatives, a professional counselor, whatever, then you may separate for the sake of saving your own life. But you cannot divorce. The basis for divorce is clear in the Bible, which is a violation of the, uh, the marital vows. I'm not being unsympathetic. I'm simply saying, if you choose to separate, you have to remain as you are, single. All right. Our last question mm -hmm. is, 
Pastor, your calling, I can tell, is to preach obedience, but that's not what saves. Okay, okay, I'll Are get to that. Are you missing the vital point? Yeah, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. I'm really eager to get to that, but I suspect it'll become my entire presentation uh, for this evening. But there was a part of a question I did not get to, which is, should I invest? I think one of the questions asked, should I invest? What, look at the second question you asked. Yes. What does it say? Is it, it says, is it okay to invest in these times? Okay. Now that's a personal decision you have to make as you view the, 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 the seriousness of the times in which we live. And also you make your decision in the light of what Jesus said, lay not up treasures on earth where moth and wrath doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Now, Ellen White does not frown on investing or saving up something for the future. She does not, but she also counsels us that we should not make this world our source of support. So that again is an individual choice you have to make as long as it doesn't make sure it does not interfere with your spiritual development and it does not create in you a dependence on worldly resources instead of a dependence upon God. And so I cannot tell you the church says do not invest. I cannot do that because our, our special messenger has given a word of approval regarding investment, but one has to be careful because what you're investing is not your money, it is God's money. And so if you do that, it has to be done well. And the reason for doing it cannot simply be your personal upkeep. It must also be targeted for support of the work of the gospel. Is that it? Yes. Those are the questions that we have for tonight. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Sister Smith. God bless you. Let me say to those of you watching, wherever you are, it is not my, my uh, practice to answer every question that comes to me. As an evangelist, I want to answer questions that can bless the widest range of people, including those who are not the Seventh-day Adventists. Jesus was sometimes asked questions and he did not answer them. You can see that in the Bible. He just didn't. He thought it unwise or unhelpful to answer at that point. And so when questions come to me, I say, Father, should I answer this or that or that? If I'm convicting not to, it is not that your question is unimportant. It is because, because God probably sees. You see, God can arrange two weeks of meetings to reach one person. He can do that to reach one person. And so I ask God, should I answer this or that or that? And based on the conviction I receive, I respond. So if I do not answer your question, it is not a comment on the worthiness of your question. It is just that I was not moved or convicted to answer that question. And I wanted to say that to you with great honesty and respect for the questions you send. Now, I... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> When I read the question that Sister Smith, read it again, Sister Smith, for us, please. I felt convicted to take time and deal with that to the point to make it my presentation. Now read that question again. I can tell that, tell that your calling is to preach obedience, but that's not okay, what's that, saved. That your calling, is that exactly the words the person uses? Pastor, your calling, I can tell, is to preach mm -hmm, obedience, mm -hmm. but that's not what saves. Mm -hmm. Are you missing the vital point? Uh -huh. He who has Christ has life. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. God bless you. Let me greet you again. Did you have a pleasant day? Nice to see you. I have some friends who came to see us from some distance away. I thank God for bringing you safely. May the Lord bless you. The Morel family. Did I say that word properly? The Morel family with three lovely daughters. God bless you, bless the lady who's not with you, and may the Lord bless the rest of you who are present. For those on their way, may God bring them safely. And let me again say how honored I am to be called by God to speak for him. It's a tremendous honor. I'm sure the angels would love to do this, but that privilege is given to human beings such as I, made of dirt. And I will try as best as I can today to represent God aright by presenting to you, Thus saith the Lord. Before I get into that, let me double check. This thing is turned off. And so I'd like you to make sure if you're not using, just if, uh, make sure it's turned off so there's no disturbance in the house of God. The second favor I ask of you is that you pray for me while I'm speaking. All I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That's quest, that request is serious. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. 
And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So please ask God to tell me what to say. And Isaiah 118 is connected to favor number three, which is think. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And so as you listen, reason, reason, reason. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, dear Father, that we can call you Father. We thank you that we can call Christ brother as well as Savior. We thank you, Father, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the protection and the guardianship of the angels. And we thank you for the fellowship of fellow believers. As we bow in your presence, dear God, grant us forgiveness if we have sinned against you. Cleanse us thoroughly, Father, and fill us with love for righteousness and hatred for sin. Give me the words to speak, Father, as I address this question at some length. Tell me what to say, how to say it, when to say it, Father. Suppress my carnal nature that my driving motivation will be your glory first and the blessing of those who listen. Wherever they are, bless them. Father in heaven, I ask you to bless the government of this country. I always pray for them. Give them wisdom to make decisions that do not interfere with the gospel. And I extend that prayer to all other governments represented by those who listen. Now, God, I commit this service to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I was told by my brother that the question-answer session was fed live to a, a ministry in Kenya, Nairobi, I believe. God bless my people over there and everywhere else that the Lord has graciously allowed me to visit as I do his work. All right. The question was sent to me, and I entitle this uh, presentation this evening as The Obedience of Faith or The Obedience of Life. The substance of the question is that I place a stress on obedience, and obedience does not save. It is Christ who saves. Let's take a look at obedience and the gospel. I encourage you, if you can, where you are, get a pencil, paper, and take some notes. We're looking at obedience and the gospel. Let us go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Our subject, the obedience of life. 1 Peter chapter 4, we read verse 17. If you have that, you may, and you come to it with me. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, mm -hmm, reading, what shall the end be of them who obey not the gospel of God? Now, <laughs> Peter is under the inspiration of the Spirit. The gospel of God must be obeyed. Now Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. That's one part of it. But the absence of obedience means the belief is false. It is dead. So Peter writes, what shall the end be of them who obey not the gospel of God? The gospel of God must be obeyed. Let us go to 2 Thessalonians Chapter 1, we read verses 7 and 8. Thank you. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. And to you who troubled, rest with us. And the Lord Jesus shall reveal from heaven, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, verse 8, taking vengeance on them that know not God, finish that verse, and that obey what? Not the gospel. Whose gospel? The gospel of Christ and the gospel of God. It's the same thing. God will take vengeance on those who obey not the gospel of Christ or the gospel of God. In other words, the gospel must be obeyed. 
this is absolutely essential the gospel must be obeyed let us go to first thessalonians chapter 4 and we'll read verse 3 first thessalonians 4 verse 3 our subject the obedience of life and i'm answering a question in sermon form why do i stress obedience when obedience does not save but disobedience destroys. So we have a serious situation. Obedience, the person says, does not save. The person needs to understand disobedience destroys. First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading verse 3, very short verse. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. We stop right there. You should abstain from fornication. The will of God is sanctification. Now, Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How is sanctification achieved, if achieved is the best word? Let us go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We just read in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Let's look at sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 is our subject. Let me pray again. Father, as I deal with this absolutely essential question, give me simple and powerful language. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you have 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22? Read carefully with me, seeing ye have what? Purified your souls, that's sanctification. Keep reading. In obeying the truth. Stop. In obeying what? The truth. Now we know thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. Um, Malachi chapter 2, verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth. Uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 19 the truth in the law and so the law is truth we just read in 1st Peter 1 22 seeing ye have purified your souls that is sanctification in obeying the truth through the spirit let me put it bluntly no obedience means no sanctification now let me say quickly the reason why there's something called Calvary is because we cannot save ourselves. Let me make that very clear. You cannot dismiss Christ and say, let me obey my way to heaven. Because obedience must not only be the mechanical act, it must be the condition of the heart. Are you with me? There must be the spirit and the letter. It is possible to keep the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill, that's the letter of the law. The spirit of the law adds to that and says, whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, is a murderer. Whosoever hates his brother, 1 John 3, 15, 14, 15, is a murderer. Now, that's the spiritual aspect. The letter of the law says, don't kill, don't shoot, don't cut off someone's head, don't poison the person. And all of us can say, I've never done that. But have you ever hated someone? So obedience is not just conformity to the letter of the law. The obedience acceptable to God is that service rendered under the control and the power and the spirit of Jesus Christ, who is also the spirit of God. And so 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit my listening friends wherever you are there is no sanctification without obedience to the will of god in uh, last day events page 267 paragraph 3 the servant of the lord writes sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience to god sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience in the same book in, in, in faith and works page 29 paragraph 2 she also write that obedience to the law of god is sanctification now let's look at the law of god the law of god is divine are you with me it is not a human product it is divine now if god gives me a divine standard 
he must give me what? To keep that standard. Divine help or divine power. He does not remove obedience because I am human and the law is divine. He gives me divine power to obey a divine law. Review and Herald, October 30, 1888, paragraph 8. Review and Herald, October 30, 1888, paragraph 8. Those who take the position that Christ has done it all, and that we need not obey the requirements or the commandments of God will fail of everlasting life. Let me say that again. The Review and Herald, October 30, 1888, paragraph 8. Those who take the position that Christ has done it all, and that we need not obey his requirements, which are his commandments, will fail of everlasting life. In paragraph 4, I just gave you paragraph 8, paragraph 4, October 30, 1888, Review and Herald, she writes, to, 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 to believe that belief is all that is necessary is a fallacy and a most dangerous doctrine. In other words, she says, those who believe that, those who say that belief is all that's necessary, that's all that's necessary, that is a fallacy and a most dangerous doctrine. There are some who believe you say to God, God, save me. And you stand still and you wait for God to save you. If you read Romans 5, and there's so much in my head that I want to say, and I'm really grateful for the question. I really am. If you read Romans 5, verse 19. You talk about obedience. That doesn't save. Even though disobedience destroys. You see, if disobedience destroys, obedience must do something. Now, Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's, what? Disobedience. Many were made sinners. So, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. If Christ had disobeyed God once. Salvation would have been impossible. Let me say it again, wherever you are. If Christ had disobeyed God once, in some microscopic area, the plan of salvation would have collapsed. The Bible says we are saved through the obedience of one. And if we are to be in the image of Christ, we must obey as he obeyed. The Bible says, He that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame. Our overcoming, our victory must be as Christ's victory because it is actually the victory of Christ lived out in us with our constant surrender to him. Obedience is required by God of everyone who claims to be a child of God. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Let us go to Galatians chapter 2. Chapter 3. Galatians 3. We read from verse 1. Our subject, the obedience of life. Galatians 3. Let's read from verse 1. When you found it, say amen. And remember the rebuke I've asked you to give me? You never do because you're nice. Oh, but, uh, I really need it because I slip into old habits very easily. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? Oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Read the next few words for me that ye should not, come on, obey, come on, the truth. Who hath bewitched you not to obey? What does it mean to bewitch? 
I don't think about a television program a hundred years ago. What does it mean to be bewitched? Take away the B-E and what do you have? Witch. Well, that's one of the devil's servants. Who hath bewitched you? And the only power that can bewitch someone to lay aside obedience is the power of Satan. Who hath bewitched you? As Eve was bewitched. That you should not obey the truth. I'm trying not to be. I'm trying to be <laughs> gentle. But this, 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 this subject really gets under my skin. It really does. It really, this business of obey and uh, disobey and uh, Christ alone saves you have nothing to do. Any, any urge to disobey God originates with Satan. Not with God. Let me say it again. Any urge. Let me add this. Go to Romans 8. Then we'll come back to Galatians. Romans 8, our subject, the obedience of life. And I'm trying to promote obedience. Not salvation by works. I'm promoting obedience. What book did I say? Romans, what chapter? 8. We'll read 7 and 8. Are you there? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Read with me now. For it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be now let's pause the way we're born the mind with which we're born is naturally opposed to what the law but give me the word that starts with O. obedience the the carnal mind listen to me carefully is naturally opposed to not only obedience to God obedience to anybody so the law says 55 miles per hour, and you get a ticket. Why? Because you disobeyed. Children have to punish their children. Why? Because they disobey. We hate when someone speaks to us in a rough voice. What do we say? Who do you think you are? You can't talk to me like that. We don't like to obey. Not just God. We just don't like to obey. That's the carnal mind. Now, even though I am converted and you are converted, a converted person still has the carnal mind. And so Paul writes in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another. The flesh is always trying to move us towards disobedience. But the spirit... Who wrote the law by the way the finger of god is the spirit of god the spirit who wrote the law on stone who writes it on our hearts he's always bringing us bringing us closer and closer to conformity with the will of god why do i say the spirit wrote it let me deal with that for someone who may have a question go to second corinthians 3 quickly then we'll come back to galatians 3 second corinthians 3 let's read from verse uh, 13 verse 3 sorry of second corinthians 3 our subject the obedience of life. Let me slow down myself. Are you there? Okay. For as much as you manifestly declared to be what? The epistles of Kahari ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the not in tables of stone, come on, but on fleshy tables of the heart. Now, what are the tables of stone intimated or suggested there in that verse? The Ten Commandments. Now, Paul says, not on those tables, but on the fleshy tables of the heart. But written by whom? The Spirit. The Spirit was the power that wrote the Ten Commandments. Christ spoke them. The Father ordered them, the Spirit wrote them. And as he wrote them on stone, he wants to write them where? On our hearts. Now, if God, and I've said this so many times, if God writes the law on our hearts, what does he want? What does he want? Obedience. Now, let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. Let's read again. Do you have it? Not yet. God bless those of you who came in just now. Galatians 3, let's read from verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Come on, read with me. That you should not what? Obey the truth. But pause. What truth? Let's go to Galatians chapter 2.
Let's read from verse 5 of Galatians 2. Paul is complaining about Jews who came to cause problems to bring the Gentile converts back to Jewish behavior. Read verse 5 of Galatians 2. What does that say? To whom we give place by subjection, no, not for an hour, keep reading, that the truth of the gospel might do what? Continue with you. Now we have the truth of the gospel in verse 5, Galatians 2. Read verse 14 of Galatians chapter 2. Are you there? Read with me. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And so in verse 5, we have the truth of the gospel. In verse 14, we have the truth of the gospel. Now read verse 1 of chapter 3 for me. You read it, I'll listen. O oh, foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you should not... Come on. What's missing from there? The truth, yes, that's what he means. O oh, foolish Galatian, who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth of the gospel. He mentioned it in verse 14 of chapter 2. He mentioned it in verse 5 of chapter 2. But he doesn't put it in verse 1 of chapter 3. In other words, you should know that's what he means. Who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth of the gospel. We saw in 1 Peter 4, 17. What shall the end be of those that obey not the gospel of God? We saw in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Christ or the gospel of God. Same gospel. Let's go on to Ephesians 5. Our subject, the obedience of life. So many of us don't understand that the most blessed life you can live is an obedient life. Ephesians 5, let's read from verse 6. First of all, Paul lists about nine different sins from verse 3 to verse 5 that he wants his church members to avoid, among all other sins, of course. But he just gives some examples. Neither filthiness, nor fornication, nor foolish talking, but which is not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, verse 5, that no homonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now that's 4 and 5. Now verse 6. Read with me now verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Now carefully. For because of these things, keep reading, cometh the wrath of God upon whom? Mm-hmm. The wrath of God comes upon the disobedient. Then what comes on the obedient? The Bible is simple. If the wrath of God comes upon the disobedient, what comes upon the obedient? Let the Bible tell you. Psalm 119 verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that serve him with the whole heart. In other words, blessed are those who obey. The last blessing of Revelation, which is the last blessing of the Bible, and the book of Revelation has seven blessings. The last blessing is a blessing for obedience. Are you following me? Now, we're talking about obeying the law of God. Listen, listen to Christ Triumphant, page 339, paragraph 2. And I hope you write these references down. Christ Triumphant, page 339, paragraph 2. By the way, let me urge those listening, take time to read the writings of Ellen White. Please. I mean, please, please. Christ came to this world, or our world, to represent the character of God as it is represented in his holy law. Because the law is a transcript of his character. Now, listen to the last sentence of that quotation. Christ was both the law and the gospel. What did I just say? Christ was the law and the gospel. Favor number three is let's reason together. Think. Jesus said, I am the door. Did he say that? Yes, I'm the door. 
John 10. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. Did he say that? Yeah. Jesus said, I'm the living bread. And we have no problem with that. Jesus said, I'm the way. And we have no problem with that. Let me tell you something. As much as Jesus is the way, as much as he is the truth, as much as he is the life, as much as he is the living bread, as much as he is the door, as much as he is the shepherd, as much as he is the living water, he is the law. He is the law. And he is the gospel. The Bible says God will destroy those who do not obey the law. To disobey the law is to disobey Christ because the law of God is personal to God. That's why when Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? We need to understand disobedience is a denial of God. In that act of disobedience, it is a denial of God. When David confesses sin in Psalm 51, he said, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and then this evil in thy sight. Psalm 51 verse 4. The law is personal to God. Why? Because it is a transcript of his character. Romans chapter, 10, verse 10, chapter 7 verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Obedience is life. Let me say again, it is obedience through the indwelling power of Jesus Christ. The simplicity of the essentials of the gospel never ceased to amaze me. You know, Adam was thrown out because he disobeyed. It makes a difference to me how you cut the Bible. Adam was thrown out because he disobeyed. That's at the beginning of the Bible. The Bible ends with this verse, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right. Mm -hmm. Blessed are they that obey, that they may have a right. Your access to the tree of life is based on your obedience through Christ. Patriots and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 2. Obedience, perfect and perpetual, was the condition of access to the tree of life. Obedience, perfect and and perpetual was a condition of access to the tree of life. Patriots and Prophets, page 479, paragraph 2. What did I say? Patriots and Prophets, page 479, paragraph 2. Listen carefully. How many years did God use Moses to lead the Israelites through the wilderness? How many? Forty. How many recorded mistakes did he make in those 40 years? How many recorded mistakes did he make in those 40 years? One. What was that? He hit the rock when he should have spoken to. Now, one. Listen to what the servant of God writes. God shut Moses out of Canaan to teach a lesson which should never be forgotten that he requires exact obedience councils for the church page 268 paragraph 5 the history of God's dealings with his people in all ages shows that he demands exact obedience my brother and sister beloved of the Lord the saints or as people say these days you guys <laughs> I don't know I would have gotten to the pulpit, but it's in the pulpit, you guys. But saints, beloved, children of God, brothers and sisters, this is a spiritual setting. Leave you guys for a social media. God. Obey God. Uh, page 463. I think it's paragraph 3 or 4. The law reveals to man his sins but provides no remedy. Now listen carefully. While it promises life to the obedient, hmm? it declares that death is the portion of the transgressor. It promises life. Obedience is life. I read in Elwise writing, she said, the only question asked in the judgment will be, were they obedient to my commands? 
The only question, I think it's uh, the West Indian Messenger, 1912, July 1. The only question asked in the judgment will be, are they obedient to my law? The first angel's message. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, you tell me what? Come on. Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation 14, what verses? 6 and 7. Uh, yes, sister. Slow down. Yo, God bless you. I have sinned, I repent. Okay. That's the first angel's message. Fear God. You read the Old Testament particularly. You always see fear, or frequently, next to obey. Fear, keep. Mm -hmm. You see, if you fear God, you obey Him. Are you following me? If you fear God, the natural response is oh, obedience is an expression of your fear. And I don't mean your dread. It means that sense of awe that you have for God. You will do whatever God says. You check some verses. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and cleave unto him. And, and it, all of that means obey. Fear God. And obey God are inseparable. I'll tell you something else. A casual assignment. Read particularly Deuteronomy. The reason why I say Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is composed merely, really, of three long speeches given by Moses. He gave those speeches just before the Israelites crossed over Jordan into Canaan. This is 40 years later. He is trying to tell, look. You're about to cross over. You need to remember this. Obey God. Avoid idols. Obey. Obey. That's the corner. Obey God. So that's why I suggest read Deuteronomy and see how often God calls the Israelites, Obey, 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 obey. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. God wants one thing from you and me, and that is obey. But we hate to obey. Because we still have the carnal nature. We hate to obey. What did Jesus say of himself? I do always those things, John 8, 29, that please him. The one word for that is, I do always obey. First John 3, 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Here is the testimony of Jesus Christ. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 10. Now in Luke 18 from verse 18. Go there quickly with me. Luke 18, verse 18. You are familiar with this passage. And if someone online is in a country where you're several hours ahead of us, it's probably, I don't know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock. Thank you very much for staying up to listen to the word of God. And may the Lord bless you beyond your expectation. What book did I say? Luke. What chapter? 18. From what verse? 18. Are you there? Read with me if you... Let me pray first. Father, as I continue, please tighten your grip on my faculties. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what? Read with me now shall I do, come on, to inherit eternal life? He didn't say, what shall I think? Although you've got to think. As a man thinketh, so is he. But he, what shall I do? Christ didn't come to this earth to, he didn't think his way on Calvary. He went to Calvary and gave his life. He didn't think his way in Gethsemane. He suffered in Gethsemane. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Go to Luke 10. Luke chapter 10, let's read from verse 25. Our subject, the obedience of life. Luke 10, reading from verse 25. Are you there? Read with me. What does that say? And 
Behold, uh, what? Certain lawyers stood up and what? Tempted him saying, what? Master, what shall I do? Same question, to inherit eternal life. What shall I do? What did Jesus tell the rich young ruler in Luke 18? Thou knowest the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't be false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Christ says, do that. Now, what did Jesus tell the lawyer? And Jesus said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now read Christ's response in the next verse. He said, Thou hast answered right. Keep going. In other words, you're right when you say obey. You are right. Keep reading. This do. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say thou shalt live, what, what does it mean by this do? Obey. What's the result? Life. You cannot separate obedience from life. The same way you cannot separate disobedience, tell me, from destruction. <sighs> ah, my brothers and sisters, Jesus said to that lawyer, what's written in the law? And he said, thou shalt love. you know, we know the law is love your neighbor, love God. First four commandments, next six. So this is the law, the commandments we're talking about. Jesus said, you do that. And you live. Listen to me very carefully. Salvation has a condition. The condition is obedience. God cannot run the risk of admitting one disobedient person into heaven. Because the crisis will start all over again. What God requires now and has always required is perfect obedience to his word. And if we surrender to him, he gives us the mind that loves to obey. Are you with me? Obedience to a converted person is an expression of love. Listen to these words from Ellen White, Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, paragraph 3. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. Someone who experiences the joy of obedience. This is a life of Christ lived out of the person. He does not enjoy, experience the joy of obedience. And she says, he does not obey. There's something called compliance. Are you with me? Then there's something called obedience. People comply to get along with others who are doing the same thing. People conform because their peer group are doing the same thing. Obedience has nothing to do with what others are doing. Obedience has to do with what did God say. Let me say it again. Compliance and conformity are associated with what others do. Either the general population or my peers. Obedience has nothing to do with what others do. Obedience has to do with what did God say. And so Joshua said, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord to serve as obey. But notice his words, as for me and my house, he is an individual in his house. If my family disobeys, finish my words, I will obey. Because obedience is not attached to what others do. Compliance is. People in prison, they comply. <laughs> Obeying God's law is bound up with who God is. This is the... So let me give you that quotation again. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience he does not obey when the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination we may know that the life is not a Christian life true obedience is the outworking of a principle within it springs from the love of righteousness the love of the law of God the essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer this will lead us to do right because it is right because right doing is pleasing to God and a converted life is lived to please God now listen to me carefully nothing pleases God like obedience and I have told God as long as I have breath 
I will appeal to people. Obey God. He tells you, give me the tithe, give it. But obey him as you stand under Calvary so you understand what he did for you. Because we love him because, come on, tell me, he first loved us. And so today, as I answer that question, which I'm so glad I got, obedience doesn't save, it's Christ. Christ is the law. Christ is the gospel. And the Bible says, Christ himself will destroy those who do not obey the gospel, who do not obey the truth, who do not obey Christ. Remove obedience and we have the catastrophe in Eden all over again. Always understand that the law is the target of Satan. And if you say you're Seventh-day Adventist, you know that the critical issue in the last days will be obedience, whether to God or to a man-made institution. We know that as verily as God tested the Israelites when they came out of Egypt on the obedience and the commandment he used was the fourth when he sent the man of six days, not on seven. Just before Christ comes the second time to take us to the heavenly Canaan, he will test us on obedience. There'll be a false Sabbath, which is already in the world, and the true Sabbath, then we'll have a choice to make. It's a choice, whom shall you obey? It goes back to Eden. God said, thou shalt surely die. The devil said, ye shall not surely die. And they chose somebody else's word ahead of God. Obeying God is the, most in is the only intelligent life to live. And if there's some area in your life where you're not obeying God, ask him for the power to obey. Yeah, it's the longest presentation I've made <laughs> since that. Yeah, I started at 10 to 6, it's 6.30, but let me say something else to you. One of the questions was, do we have to understand the sanctuary? Yes. Now, you may not understand it the way some seminary professor does, but you should learn as much of the sanctuary as you can to understand the essentials of the gospel. We should do that. Try to understand what the sanctuary teaches so that you and I can more fully, more fully, something I want to tell you but it slipped my mind, more fully understand what Jesus Christ has done for us. Well, let me just close. What I wanted to say slipped me. Make a decision right where you are to obey God. Do you know the angels also obey the same law? Listen to Psalm 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. The law of God, as we read in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And the will of God is the law of God, Romans 2, 17 to 19. And so I call upon you in the name of Jesus whose blood covers you, Make up your mind. Choose to obey God. Let me give you a guarantee. You will never regret it. As a Christian, we will have difficulties. Yes, the devil will see to that. But many of our difficulties are brought on by flat-out disobedience. You know, Peter said in 1 Peter 4.15, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. We bring hardships through disobedience. There are hardships that will come simply because you've accepted Christ and declared yourself to be an enemy of Satan. Hardships will come, yes. But too many hardships come through simple disobedience to God. Do you want a clear conscience? Obey God. Mm-hmm. Obey God. To the limit, he has revealed his will to you. And so God bless the person who sent a question. And I hope I've said something to help everyone who listened to understand a little more the absolute importance of obeying God. Because obedience is simply love in action. Are you with me? Obedience is simply love in action. And he or she who does not obey does not love you can say whatever you like with your lips he or she who does not jesus said why call ye me lord lord and do not the things that i say he says that why do you call me lord and you don't obey 
say with me tonight? How many of you will say with me, Lord, give me a heart to obey you. Can I see your hand? Hands down, keep your head, but just bow your heads. Father, I hope I wasn't too hard on your people whom you love. But you know how much this means to me, obeying Christ. Yes, your law is a divine law. And human beings by themselves cannot obey a divine law because we're dirt. That's why you grant us power from above. The very life of Christ through the indwelling of his spirit. Please God, your word says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. With this mind, obeying you will be our highest delight. So that we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. We can say like the psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 20, My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgment at all time. He's so long for your statutes and your law. Give us that longing day, God, to obey you. Write your law again in our hearts, I pray. Bless all those who listened. May we leave this place determined to embarrass the devil by obeying you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you tomorrow, same time, same place.